Senate will spend much of the day discussing the Senate Democratic and House Republican debt ceiling plans. Due to Senate rules, 30 hours must pass before the Senate can vote on moving forward on Senator Reid's plan, which puts the vote at about 1 a.m. Eastern Time. Great is your power, and your understanding is infinite. We need you on Capitol Hill. As we gather this Saturday, a nation looks to our government's legislative branch for responsible action. Deliver our lawmakers from the paralysis of analysis when constructive and prompt action is desperately needed. Faced with potentially disastrous consequences, give the members of this body the wisdom to work while it is day, for the night comes when no one can work. We pray in your great name. Amen. The, uh, please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., July 30th, 2011, to the Senate, under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Patrick J. Leahy, a senator from the state of Vermont, to perform the duties of the chair. Signed, Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. Majority Leader. I, just as a side note, I'm happy to see the second-ranking member of the United States Senate presiding. People of Vermont have been so fortunate to have you and your wisdom and your. Uh, I expect you haven't done that in 30 years. <laughs> well, I did. I thought it would be nice to comment on the fact that that's reserved for more junior members. It's nice that uh, my friend from Vermont would be here. Following <clears throat> any leader remarks, the Senate will resume consideration of the motion to concur in the House message to accompany S626. The legislative vehicle for the debt limit increase. The time from 1.30 to 8 p.m. will be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or the designees. Mr. President, Republican leaders in the House of Representatives wasted this week pursuing a right-wing proposal they knew from the start couldn't pass the Senate. From the very beginning, Speaker Boehner's Band-Aid approach was fatally flawed. It would have put us back on this incredible position that we are in today, debating over whether that debt limit should be increased. Something was increased, I don't know really how many times, but about 15 or 20 times during the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Um, I, um, I have a, a little whisper to my left that said 18 times, so 19 to 20 wasn't too bad. Uh, the Band-Aid approach that, that the speaker came up with was totally flawed. It would have put us back in this incredible position of fighting to increase the debt limit. Something was done 18 times during Ronald Reagan's administration. We would be fighting the clock to prevent financial collapse. We would start that again in just a few weeks. The Speaker's legislation was a concession to Tea Party extremists, yet it barely passed the House yesterday with only Republican votes, and it failed on a bipartisan basis last night in the Senate. There was an interesting article in the New York Times yesterday, headline, The Centrist Cop-Out. The facts of the crisis over the debt ceiling aren't complicated. Republicans have, in effect, taken America hostage, threatening to undermine the economy and disrupt the essential business of government unless they get policy concessions they would never have been able to get through legislation. 
That's the way it is, Mr. President. It couldn't be said more clearly. But knowing all along that this radical legislation, which was neither balanced nor bipartisan, would not and could not pass in our chamber, Democrats have been working on a true compromise in the Senate. We've solicited ideas from our Republican friends and colleagues. Let it never be said that Democrats in the Senate were afraid to compromise. We welcome compromise. As recently as yesterday, I asked my friend, the Senate Minority Leader, to help make this Senate compromise more palatable. But we have heard very little from the Republicans. I'm satisfied that um, the conversations I've had with a couple of Republicans this morning, I hope bears fruit. I spoke to my, the chairman of the Budget Committee just a short time ago. One of the proposals propounded by a Republican, my friend, Senator Conrad, is working on it to see if it, he can work it out so that it is a language that is something that we can all live with. Senator Conrad is an expert with budget matters, and I thought it was important that he take a look at that. I would have hoped, though, that someone would come to us, come to the table, the bargaining table, on behalf of the Republican caucus with ideas to improve a proposal already cut from a Republican call, Republican cloth. Mr. President, Democrats are still willing to sit down and negotiate. My door is still open. I say again, I appreciate that several of my Republican colleagues have reached out to me over even the last few hours, hoping to reach a compromise. Senate Democrats welcome their input and look forward to working with them on a path forward. But my friend, the Republican leader, must generate some more action on behalf of his Republicans. The two parties must work together to forge an agreement that preserves this nation's economy. We will need input of reasonable Republicans, including my friend, the Republican leader, to get this done. But, Mr. President, unbelievably, another filibuster stands in our path. The Republican filibuster has become routine. From the smallest measure to the greatest matter of national importance, they stall and delay and use every procedural trick in the book to keep this body from doing its job. But a filibuster at this late hour, and when so much is at risk, is irresponsible. It puts our economy at risk. A majority vote was good enough for the Speaker's proposal in the House yesterday. But Republicans believe it isn't good enough for the Senate today. And I have heard from my friends on the House side to show how they are gaming the system over there, Mr. President. <clears throat> They're going to have a vote on my proposal on suspension for those of us who served in the House. This is for naming courthouses and little measures that are of little importance. But yet this important matter, this matter dealing with the debt, li debt limit of this country, will take a two-thirds vote to pass over there. <laughs> so they have gamed this system from the very beginning. And as I said, Mr. President, earlier from the New York Times article, the facts of this crisis over the debt ceiling aren't complicated. Republicans have, in effect, taken America hostage, threatening to undermine the economy and disrupt the essential business government unless they get policy concessions they would never have been able to enact through legislation. So they're going through the, as I understand, on the House side, uh, an effort to vote on our legislation, <clears throat> setting up a two-thirds standard to get this done. Recognizing, of course, Mr. President, that I will outline here in a minute, that a filibuster at this late hour here in the Senate, and when so much is at risk, is really irresponsible. And to say it puts our economy at risk is an understatement, and that's for sure. A majority of vote, I repeat, was good enough for the Speaker's proposal in the House, but Republicans believe it isn't good enough for the Senate today. Rather than filibuster, I ask my Republican colleagues to work with Democrats to make our proposal better. We've offered a reasonable, rational way for Republicans to help us avert default. But let me tell you about the legislation issue, how we believe how reasonable our legislation is. This legislation was written by Democrats with both parties' principles in mind. It would avert default while cutting $2.5 trillion from the deficit over a decade. It includes no revenues, concession to House Republicans and Senate Republicans, it establishes a joint congressional committee 
to find additional savings this year and guarantees that committee's recommendations will see an up or down vote on the Senate floor. And it takes into consideration that they, that committee must take into consideration proposals like the Gang of Six. And literally every single spending cut and it has been voted on or endorsed by Republicans in both houses. That's the gist of the legislation. $2.5 trillion dollars extending the debt ceiling until March of 2013. Pretty fair deal. Now, Mr. President, we've made a, some changes to this proposition. We hope it becomes more amenable to Republicans. We have improved the program integrity language to allow for more savings by combating government waste and fraud. We've removed a measure that would have raised revenue by selling the spectrum some $15 billion, which will be done. We should, should do it now. Which would have, but it caused what is called a blue slip problem, which says if you have any revenue measure, according to our Constitution, they have to originate in the House. So to present the so-called blue slip problem, I just eliminated from this bill. It was $15 billion out of $2.5 trillion. We also added a process conceived by my friend, Senator McConnell, to allow two additional votes over the next year and a half, two motions of disapproval before the President may raise the debt ceiling. This proposal also protects Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid benefits. But as you can see, this amendment was designed to appeal to our Republican colleagues as well as to our Democrat colleagues. We're willing to listen to ideas, I've said this several times, from Republican senators to make this proposal better. But Mr. President, to say the time is short is an understatement. We can amend the underlying legislation that's here before us in the so-called message of the House. We still have time to do that. We have time to do that. We could do it tonight, and we could still meet the deadline on Tuesday. But we need to do it soon. That's why 1.10 in the afternoon, this Saturday, I hope I have more Republicans contact me and see if we, they can work out something to work with us. Already the economy has gone from bad to worse. Stocks continue a week-long slide yesterday. I know my Republican colleagues love this country, every single one of them. I believe they want to do what's best for our economy, every single one of them. But Mr. President, I have to say, and I say for the third time, the facts of the crisis over the debt ceiling aren't complicated at all. Republicans have, in effect, taken America hostage, threatening to undermine the economy and disrupt the essential business of government unless they get policy concessions they would never have been able to enact through legislation. That's why, together, we must avert a default that would jeopardize veterans' benefits, senior citizens' benefits, Social Security payments, and checks for troops, even troops on the front line. It would also effectively raise taxes on every American family, Vermont, Illinois, Kentucky, Idaho, Nevada, all over this country, Oregon, all the centers on the floor, even Wyoming, who doesn't pay much in the way of taxes. Uh, not, we could do that, Mr. President. It would effectively raise taxes on every American family, and businesses would also suffer this, increasing the cost of everything from groceries to the mortgage. And so I urge my Republican friends to join me to move forward with the only compromise plan that's left. In fact, the only option left at all to save this country from default. The Republican leader. Mr. President, there's nobody in the Senate I respect and admire more than my uh, counterpart, the Democratic leader. But we've been subjected last night and again just a few moments ago, I would say to my colleagues from Wyoming and Idaho, to some Orwellian discussion about what is a filibuster. Now, most Americans, when asked the question, what is a filibuster, would believe that it was delaying something. Delaying something. So we have the astonishing development here that my good friend, the majority leader, is delaying a vote on something he wants to pass. We were prepared to have this vote last night. We're prepared to have this vote momentarily. We're prepared to have this vote at any point. And I want to disabuse my good friend of the notion that somehow it's going to pass. We just, he hasn't seen it yet, but we just delivered a letter to his office with 43 of my colleagues on it saying they didn't go to, they're not going to vote for it. The House of Representatives is going to speak at 2.30 on this issue. They're not going to vote for it. And with regard to the 60-vote threshold, let me quote my good friend, the Majority Leader. 
on March the 5th of 07, quote, in the Senate, it's always been the case you need 60 votes. January 30th of the same year, 60 votes are required for just about everything. Now, look, we, we know that on controversial matters in the United States Senate, it has for quite some time required 60 votes. So I would say again to my friend, it's pretty hard to make a credible case that denying a, vo a vote on your own proposal is anything other than a filibuster. And we know that August, August 2nd is Tuesday. The American people are frustrated with us. They want us to come together and make, reach an agreement. The measure my good friend is offering is not acceptable to the Senate, is not acceptable to the House, will not pass. I think the American people would appreciate it if we'd go on and get that out of the way and get serious about talking. And with regard to talking, let me say who ought to be in the talks. The majority leader and myself and the speaker and, and the minority leader of the House has spent most of last weekend talking to each other. In fact, we've been called down to the White House for a meeting around 11 o'clock on that Saturday, and I suggested to the President he give us a chance to go up to the Hill and see what we could work out together. And we came close enough together to where my good friend, the Majority Leader, while I understand he believes that he didn't fully endorse it, but at least went down there to advocate what we thought we could agree to on that a Sunday afternoon. And the President said no. And so I became convinced that even though my friend, the majority leader, and I would love to work this out, we can't do it by ourselves. It has to have the only person in America who can sign something into law. 307 million Americans, but only one, can sign something into law. So my suggestion to my good friend, the majority leader, is let's have the vote on his proposal. It isn't going to pass. <clears throat> and let's get to talking <clears throat> to the administration again in the hopes that we can come together behind something that can pass both the Senate and the House and be signed into law before Tuesday. Now, I, you know, don't blame anybody for being confused about what's been going on here in Congress this week, but I'd like to take a moment to explain what's going on right now. Last night, the Democrats who control the Senate proposed a bill that would lead to the largest debt ceiling increase in the history of the United States and which completely ignores the roots of this crisis. This bill has one goal, to get the President through his next election without having to have another national debate about the consequences of his policies. The President wants to make sure this kind of debate doesn't happen again, even as he gets Democrats in Congress to give him permission to add trillions more to the debt. That's what the Reid bill does. It isn't going anywhere, as I just described. It will not pass the Senate. It will not pass the House. It is simply a non-starter. Senate Republicans refuse to go along with this transparently political and deeply irresponsible ploy to give the President cover to make our debt crisis even worse than it already is. And 43 of us, as I indicated earlier, have now signed a letter to the Majority Leader pledging that we will not vote for your $2.4 trillion debt limit amendment, which, if enacted, would result in the single largest debt ceiling increase in the history of the United States. Moreover, as I indicated earlier, we will soon know with certainty this bill can't pass the House of Representatives, as they will be voting on it shortly. So since there is no possibility that this bill would be enacted into law, I would say again to my friend that he hold the vote on his proposal here and now. We're ready at any point to go on and have that vote and not waste another minute of the nation's time on this reckless piece of legislation that we know won't pass. Earlier this week, the majority leader told the Speaker of the House he was wasting the nation's time by proceeding with a bill that Senate Democrats had pledged to block a bill that the majority leader himself helped put together, but which he decided to oppose, as I indicated after the president said he didn't like it. So the question now is this. Why would my friend, the majority leader, waste the nation's time by refusing to vote on his own bill, on his own bill, which we also know will fail? 
Why wouldn't he take his own advice and get it over with? Well, the answer seems to be obvious. The Democrats are running out the clock. They want to delay the hard work of negotiation until the August 2nd deadline they've been warning us about all summer. The Democrats' entire strategy this particular week, since last Sunday, has been to run out the clock so the nation focuses more on the August 2nd deadline than on their own failure to do something about the underlying problem. Republicans have now passed two pieces of legislation that would put us on a path to fiscal sanity. Not one, but two have passed the House of Representatives. Democrats have spent the last few weeks figuring out how to avoid that particular bill. Democrats have spent their time talking about the Tea Party instead of talking about a solution. They've done absolutely nothing but stand in the way of a meaningful solution to this crisis and criticize Republicans for having the audacity to suggest that we might try to balance the books. So now we're reduced to this. They won't even allow a vote on their own bill. They're delaying the inevitable so they can avoid doing anything responsible. And it's simply indefensible. So once again, I would ask my good friend, the Majority Leader, let us vote on his legislation. Let's get this irresponsible bill that we know will fail up for a vote so we can get down to the real work of negotiating a solution to the crisis with, as I indicated earlier, the only person in America who can sign something into law, the President of the United States. Now, the lesson from last weekend is that anything the two parties agree to here doesn't mean a thing if the President decides he doesn't like it. The Democrats will abandon their own agreements, and I don't blame them. Look, I've, I've been leader of the party in the Senate when we had a Republican president. It's a tough spot. You're not a free agent. We don't have time to go through that again. We've got a couple of days here to work this out, and we can't do it without the president. Republicans have proposed solution after solution to this crisis. It's time for our friends on the other side including the President of the United States, to figure out how we're going to come together and solve this problem. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. I believe that my distinguished Republican friend must be a little bit confused because he's usually totally logical. But here he tells the American people this morning, he was called the White House last week and said, Mr. President, let us do the deal. And now he's telling the President that he wants the President to do the deal. Somewhat illogical. And I want to make sure that everyone here in the Senate understands clearly that when negotiations took place last Sunday and in a meeting that took place between Leader Pelosi, me, the Speaker, and Senator McConnell, and we tried very hard to work something out. But everyone should understand when we left that meeting, we did not have anything worked out. We had nothing worked out. It was still they were focusing on a six-month extension, trying to come up with a trigger for the Joint Committee, which we have never been able to accomplish. So it's okay that they keep talking about an agreement that the President overruled. Well, but you can't, over, you can't point? overrule an agreement that you don't have. Would my friend just yield on that point? Yield. Okay, if that's the case, then it proves my point. We cannot do, cannot reach an agreement without the President. We tried that, and I, I, I'll concede the point. My friend says he didn't actually agree to that. I'll, I'll take his word for it. Uh, but it, it makes my point that there's simply no way under our constitutional system for my friend and I to work this out. We've got to have the President at the table, and uh, I think the approach we tried last weekend, I think we both agreed, did not lead to an agreement. Mr. President. Um, the President of the United States, in the presence of Senator McConnell, Senator Durbin, Senator Kyle, and the House leaders, said to all of us, no president in the history has spent as much time as I have on a combined basis meeting with leaders trying to come up with some effort on this budget problem that we're having today. The President has spent hours of his time, days of his time, weeks of his time working on this. As we know that 
he believed that he had, as I understand it, two tentative agreements with the speaker. The speaker backed out of both of those. The president, I haven't spoken to him this morning, but I talked to him several times yesterday, he's willing to work with anybody that will give him a proposal. And that's my point today, Mr. President, as I've said earlier. The letter's coming, terrific, saying from the, I haven't received it yet, but I, I'm sure it's coming, that the Republicans say they won't vote for my piece of legislation. Well, what will they vote for? Did they have any ideas? Let me know. I'll be happy to work it in. We have gone so far as even to accept the Republican bill that we got from the House as a shell. No one has to worry about it being my bill. It'll be, if we work something out, it'll be the Boehner bill. If that makes everybody point, happy. But my friend yield on that point? Be happy I think the answer is a, a bill the president agrees to sign. I mean, that's what we were trying to achieve last <clears throat> weekend, and we, we don't have time to ping pong stuff back and forth across the hill anymore. Um, I think you and I are probably in basic agreement here. With two days left, the only thing the Congress has time to deal with and should deal with is something the President of the United States has, says he's willing to sign. I'm certainly not critical of the President for not spending time on this. He's spent an enormous amount of time on it. We just haven't gotten a result yet. Mr. President, um, we're here dealing with reality, not a world of fantasy. We're dealing with reality, and the reality is is a deficit is fast approaching where we have to raise it or default on our debt. We have a matter before this body that would increase the debt ceiling until March of 2013. It would reduce the debt by $2.4 trillion on basically issues that the Republicans have voted on. They, they talk about, well, we, I don't think we need to do the overseas contingency fund because the wars that were started and they're still going on by President Bush have created, cost a lot of money, lots of money, trillions of dollars. The Congressional Budget Office and the Office of Management and Budget has said those wars are winding down. As a result of that, we save a trillion dollars. They've scored it. That's a re reduction in our debt. I also think, Mr. President, that if the Republicans have some way they want to approve my legislation, please let somebody know. If they, if they don't want to call me, call the President of the United States. But we have to work forward. Mine is the only proposal we have. If mine passes, and we're going to continue to push this, because it should pass, because it's the only thing we have left. Now, my friend says, let us vote. We say the same thing. Let us vote. We want to have a vote. But why in the world is something as important as this? Why can't we have just an up or down vote like they had in the House? And to further underline my point, my friend, the assistant Democratic leader, the whip, served in the House longer than I did. And they are taking up over there today, as I understand it, on what we call a consent calendar, which are non, um, they're issues that are of minor importance, no controversy whatsoever. They're taking up extending the debt ceiling on that calendar, I think that's unheard of. So we're willing to vote. We're willing to work, vote right now, 60 vote. 60 votes we're not willing to take because this is a filibuster. This should not be filibustered. And so, Mr. President, uh, we, we're, we, we are not going to agree to the six-month proposal because, we're, as I indicated in my prepared remarks, that would mean that we would be back in this mess in a matter of weeks. Uh, we want to be fully engaged. I repeat to the people that are supposedly sending me this letter, what do you want? What do, I say to my, what do I say to my caucus because my Republican colleagues haven't come up with any alternative? It would be easy to do. We can amend my legislation. In the meantime, that won't happen. We're going to proceed forward and do the very best we can to overcome this filibuster. Mr. President. The Republican leader. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just wrap up my comments by pointing out again uh, comments from my good friend, the Majority Leader, about the nature of the Senate. He said, in the Senate, it's always been the case you need 60 votes. It's always been the case you need 60 votes. We, we all know that. It, it's a very, uh, it, it's widely known in, in the country now as well. And most people believe a filibuster means you're trying to delay something. And I want to make clear to the American people, Senate Republicans are ready to vote 
on the read cloture on the read proposal in 30 minutes in an hour as soon as we can get our colleagues over to the floor we're ready uh, to vote but six requiring 60 votes particularly on a matter of this enormous importance is not at all unusual it's the way the senate operates so mr president <clears throat> Mr. President, excuse me, I, I'll not belabor it any further. We'd be happy to vote at any time the majority leader thinks it would be appropriate to vote on his uh, proposal. I yield the floor. Mr. President, a filibuster is known all over America as a way to stall, to prevent votes. That's all this is about. If my Republican colleagues are so anxious to vote, let us have a vote. That would, we would move this matter down the field very quickly. And finally, I would say, the matter that is now known as the Reed Amendment. Is that the President's first choice? No. He wanted to do what he called the Grand Deal, and he thought he had that worked out with the Speaker. But the President knows what I have put forward is good for the country. It extends the debt ceiling, it reduces the debt. So I say to my friend, the Republican leader, the President will sign my legislation. My friend says that he wants something the President would sign. He will sign this. He'll sign it. We could pass it tonight get it through the House, he would sign it tomorrow. So, Mr. President, I would hope the world understands, our country understands, because all senators understand, there is another filibuster being conducted on an effort to prevent our moving forward to handle the debt situation we have in our country. Under the uh, previous order, leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of the motion to refer the House message to Company S627, which the clerk will report. Motion to concur in the House Amendment to S627, an act to establish the Commission on Freedom of Information Act processing delays with an amendment. And under the previous order, the time from 1.30 until 7.30 shall be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees in alternating 30-minute blocks, the majority controlling the first block of time. The Senator from Illinois. Mr. President, those who are following this debate, and I think many across America are, should understand what just happened. There was a discussion about the filibuster. The filibuster is a Senate rule that does two things. It says that you can't move an item to a vote, and you have to wait a period of time to have what's called a cloture vote. And in order to pass a cloture vote, you need 60 votes, not a majority. So I'd just correct, if I can, the record. A filibuster does more than delay the vote. It establishes a higher vote requirement, 60 votes, not a majority. Yesterday, the Speaker of the House brought before his body of 435 members the proposal to end this deadlock. He received 218 votes, one more than half of the membership. He had a majority vote, not one more, but a majority vote. We are asking for the same opportunity. Let us bring our proposal forward for a majority vote. The Republicans have refused. They have put us in a filibuster. They have said, no, we will require 60 votes and we will delay the vote until possibly 1 a.m. Sunday morning. That's where we are. Let me say a word about the underlying issue. This morning, Mr. President, uh, like many members of the Senate, I wanted to get away from this place and spend a few minutes reflecting on something other than the give and take of the political debate. I got up early and walked over to Eastern Market, bought a cup of coffee, and sat on the bench for about three hours, just watching people walk by to try to clear my mind. And while sitting there, I got an email from a buddy of mine from high school. Now, that goes back a few years. His name's Ed Renolette, and he lives in Florida. And I'd like to read into the record what my buddy from high school wrote to me this morning. He said, I sent this email to our Republican senator in Florida, too. I've rode out the storms of many high seas in the last 20 or so years. This one has me worried. Let's get the ship on the right course and get this fixed. He goes on to say, you all need to get past being Democrats and Republicans. Many mistakes have been made over the past years. Compromise and get this squared away. I am in the later years of my life, he writes, and I'll be damned, he says, if I want to see it go down the drain because you all can't agree on the debt issue. 
I am neither a Democrat, Republican, or Tea Party person. I'm an American, and I believe that you both have my best interest at heart. Eddie Renolette from Florida. I would just say that under these circumstances, he expresses the views of many people across America. This is not a crisis which we couldn't control. This isn't an earthquake or a tornado or a hurricane. It isn't a war. It is a created political crisis. The extension of the debt ceiling has been done routinely 89 times since 1939, 50 time, 55 times by Republican presidents, 34 times by Democratic presidents, and President Ronald Reagan holds the record having extended the debt ceiling 18 times in eight years without a confrontation, without the American economy threatening a collapse. This is a manufactured political crisis, and it's time for both parties to rise up and come up with a solution. What the majority leader has put on the table, half of it was a proposal by Senator McConnell, the Republican leader. Some people didn't like it. But Majority Leader Reid said, it'll be bipartisan. I'm putting McConnell's proposal on the table. I'm going to put a proposal as well on the table from our side, make it bipartisan, and move it forward. Now 43 Republican senators have said they're not voting for it. So we are at a standoff. A word about the President's role in this. President Obama, and I know this because I attended the meetings as a member of the leadership here, President Obama spent more time on this issue than any president I can recall. He met at least six or seven times for two and three hours at a time with the leadership of the House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans, and tried to work out differences. He proposed the creation under Vice President Biden's leadership of a group that would negotiate. It set and met for months, and then finally, the Republican leader in the House, Eric Cantor, walked out, and he made quite a noise as he left the room. He said, I don't want to be part of this anymore. And then the president started dealing with Speaker Boehner directly to try to get something worked out, and twice Speaker Boehner walked away from that. So the president, to fault him in this process, is not fair. He has engaged all the leaders time and time again. Last Saturday, as Senator McConnell said, he said, we no longer need the president in this picture. We're going to do it ourselves. Well, we spent a week at it, and we have not achieved that. I'm sure the president is ready and willing to do everything in his power to get this back on track. Mr. President, what is at stake in this debate is the fate of the American economy at a point when we are recovering from a recession with millions of Americans out of work. Those who are showing great bravado and great political speeches here are calling bluffs with other people's chips. What's going to happen at the end of the day here, regardless of what the politicians say back and forth, is that ordinary people are going to be affected. Their lives, their businesses, their savings are going to be affected by what we decide to do in the next few days. I think what we need to do is clear, and Senator Reid's proposal addresses it. Number one, reduce spending. Let's get this deficit under control. Speaker Reed, or Senator Reid's proposal does just that. $2.4 trillion in spending reductions, all of which have been voted for by Republicans already. So there's no controversy there. It's bipartisan. Secondly, we cannot lurch into another round of this debate every few months. The President is right, and this bill reflects it, that we need to move this debate until after next year so that our economy is strong again and the next debt ceiling vote will be in 2013. Let's not face this again and again. America doesn't want to see this movie over and over. I would also say the provision in Senator Reid's bill proposed by Senator McConnell that would, in fact, uh, say that the president has to personally ask to extend the debt ceiling is a responsibility the president will accept, and he should accept. I think what Senator Reid has offered is a balanced approach, a bipartisan approach, and it should be the basis for a compromise. But I certainly hope one thing comes out of this exchange on the floor this morning. I hope that Senator McConnell will finally agree to sit down with Senator Reid on a bipartisan basis work with the House leaders and the President and get this done. The American people are running out of patience if they haven't already run out of it, and we're running out of excuses. We have a limited amount of time left here to avert a crisis that will affect a lot of innocent people across America. It is time for us to roll up our sleeves on a bipartisan basis to get this job done. Mr. President, I yield for The Senator yield for a question. Be happy to yield for a question. Um, 
The Republican leader a few moments ago said that it happens around here from time to time that 60 votes are required. Is it not true that the reason from time to time 60 votes are required is because there is a threat of a filibuster unless the opponents succeed in getting an agreement that there be 60 votes? It's the short way to find out whether or not debate will be ended. Is it not true, though, that it's the threat of a filibuster that the opponents make which produces an agreement to get 60 votes. Senator from Michigan has been here longer than I have. He knows this better than I do, but he's right. This threat of a filibuster has raised the vote requirement from a majority to 60, and that is the issue that was being discussed on the And floor. is it not true, may I ask my friend, that whether or not the threat is carried out or not, we will know tonight at 1 o'clock. Because at 1 o'clock, is it not true, tomorrow morning, we will vote not on the read measure, but on a petition which 18 senators signed, which reads as follows, that we, the undersigned senators, in accordance with Rule 22, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on the read motion. Is that not true? That's, a, that's what the vote will be at 1 in the morning. And so what we will be voting on is not as the Republican reader, uh, leader characterized it, we, which he says he's willing to vote on right away, is not a vote on the Reid motion, but a vote on whether we will end debate on the Reid motion. And is it not further true that people who vote tonight know are voting to filibuster the Reid motion? The senator from Michigan is correct, and those who say they want to bring this to a vote will have an opportunity to join us in doing so by producing at least 60 votes when we vote at 1 in the morning. And finally, would the senator from Illinois agree that if tonight Republicans refuse to bring this debate to a halt and to allow a vote on the Reid motion, would you not agree that there will be a strong negative public reaction to a filibuster on a measure in the face of an economic calamity which would avoid that calamity. I would agree with the Senator from Michigan. Time is of the essence. Any delay at this point jeopardizes any possibility of a compromise to avert this economic crisis. I, I thank my friend. I, Mr. I yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Vermont. Mr. President, I would just add to what uh, Senator Reid and Senator Durbin and Senator Levin have said. Uh, the 60 vote is a filibuster. It is to block this. Now, we speak of how long people have been here. I came here, President Ford was president. Served with President Ford, President Carter, President Reagan, President George H.W. Bush, President William Jefferson Clinton, President George W. Bush, and now President Obama. At no time with any of those presidents prior to President Obama was there ever a request for a 60 vote uh, a, a 60 member vote to raise the debt limit silly. Certainly with the number of times we raised the debt limit under President Ronald Reagan, not one single Republican suggested we needed 60 votes is important enough for that. Not once under President George H.W. Bush, not once under President George W. Bush did a single Republican say it's so important we must have a 60 vote margin. And yet, all of a sudden, with President Obama, the whole, the whole criteria changes. Suddenly, the rules that were good enough for Republicans with a Republican president are suddenly to be changed with this president. Sir, Mr. President, the American public, Republican or Democratic, can see through that. This is a different standard. We're saying that this president must follow different rules than every president before him, Republican or Democratic. That just, there is no way that can be considered fair. It can, no way that can be considered anything but a gimmick. As unfortunately, the partisan faction first manufactured this debt limit crisis. And now they're trying, they continue to prevent a bipartisan solution. An unwillingness to compromise and find a bipartisan solution has led us to the brink. 
The United States of America is now just three days away from defaulting on its obligation, and I'd remind senators for the first time in the history of this country, and for the first time in the history of this country, senators are demanding we have to have a supermajority vote to stop that from happening. That is not responsible. We are needlessly risking financial turmoil throughout this great country, and it would send ripple effects worldwide. A temporary solution is no solution at all. It would undermine the stability that our economy needs to grow. So now is the time to set aside partisan bickering, pass a bill. It's the time for the grown-ups in the room to take over and reach a bipartisan solution to the debt ceiling, as has been done every time in the 37 years I've been here. A my way or no way faction, the other bodies had no qualms about playing Russian roulette with our entire economy and with every American family in it. And regrettably, as we saw so clearly again yesterday, the House leadership's response to win this faction's vote has simply been to shift the bill even further away from helpfulness or reality. Everybody knows that the House debt bill written under this duress was a sham with no chance of passing and with no chance of averting a debt catastrophe. On Friday, at the finish line to vote in the debt bill, House leaders added to their package the idea of amending the U.S. Constitution with a budget amendment. It's done as a desperate attempt to win a few more votes. Now, this is not the time for bumper sticker politics. It's time for leadership and bipartisanship. Now, many in this body recall, as I do, the period just two short decades ago when we were able to not only balance the federal budget, but to create budget surpluses that were on their way to paying off the national debt. Now, on the one hand, we had people who said, well, let's, let's pass a constitutional amendment for some time, a decade or two decades in the future. We stood up and actually voted to balance the budget. Not a single Republican voted to balance the budget. They talk about it, but not a single Republican voted to balance the budget. We had to actually have the Vice President Gore uh, uh, vote in this body because it was a tie vote. But it balanced the budget. It created enormous surpluses. It started paying down the national debt. Over 20 million new jobs were created. And President Clinton was able to give a huge surplus to President George W. Bush. Now, unfortunately, decisions made by a new administration and ratified by a new Congress squandered the surplus, started once again piling up debt. So this good and great nation does not need the straitjacket of a one-size-fits-all change to our Constitution to do what needs to be done. We've done it. The American people want and need and deserve is a return to wise and disciplined leadership. We need the return of willingness by those of us chosen to serve within the halls of government to cooperate, form, forge bipartisan solutions. At this point, Majority Leader Reid's debt reduction package of $2.2 trillion in spending cuts is Congress's best chance to avoid a default and prevent a disastrous credit rating downgrade. Unlike the House plan, the Reid solution is an invitation to consensus. The Senate solution incorporates spending reductions reached in bipartisan negotiations, yields greater overall budget savings sooner than the House proposal, but it also saved the country, the ordeal going through this torment again just a few months from now. And we've just seen what this debate, as we take longer and longer to do what we need to do, we watch the stock market just crash this week alone. And as this calamity has unfolded in slow motion, it's been smothering the chance for action nearly all other national priorities, from jobs to national security to air traffic control. The congressional deadlock has prevented passage of a routine renewal of the Federal Aviation Administration's charter to operate. Today, the Senate could be considering the American Events Act. That's a bipartisan bicameral bill, ready to move across the finish line, creates hundreds of thousands of jobs, 
that unleashes American innovation does not add a penny to the deficit. Instead of acting on constructive necessary priorities, we're stuck playing a dangerous game with our economy. The deadline for default would not change. I commend Leader Reid for his willingness and desire to work in the spirit of compromise with the Republican leader and others to find a bipartisan solution to halt this perilous march to the edge of the financial cliff. The American people want this solved. All American people do. Now, with a fair solution through the give and take of our representative government, not by some extra special vote, but just vote it up or vote it down. And I'm confident if we work together, Congress will avert this looming man-made economic calamity. It's late, but it's not yet too late for Republicans and Democrats to come together for the sake of our country and fashion a bipartisan solution to raise the debt limit, and reduce our long-term debt, and give our economy the long-term foundation to prosper. I've had the privilege to represent Vermont the United States Senate for 37 years. I've been blessed enough to witness many times when the Senate has shown its remarkable ability to rise up to reflect the conscience of the nation. I believe that now is such a time for Democrats and Republicans in the Senate, for the good of the country, to once again rise to the occasion, to have us be the conscience of the nation. I yield the floor. Mr. President, the Senator from Florida. Mr. President, while the distinguished uh, senator from Michigan is here on the floor, uh, who is one of the best uh, legal minds in the Senate, uh, I wanted to engage him to further take us through the delay tactics that are presently in, uh, now underway. Uh, given the fact that we have a solution right underneath our noses, a solution that is so close between the two opposite sides uh, that all we'd have to do is to have a majority vote or all we'd have to do is to have a few Republican senators. But we are engaged in this stalling tactic that is literally going to take us all night. And I would like to ask the distinguished senator from Michigan, uh, given the rules, uh, given the fact that uh, a filibuster is now underway, what can the minority here in the Senate hope to achieve since we are so close to agreement? Well, the reason that people filibuster is to try to defeat a measure, um, and uh, stalling, delaying a vote here is much worse than just defeating a measure. It is defeating the American economy. It will be putting the American economy in a ditch if we do not resolve this issue. So we've got to be very clear on what the vote is tonight. It is not a vote on the Reed Amendment, on the Reed Measure. It is a vote on this petition to bring the debate, and this is the words of the petition, we, 18 senators, move to bring to a close the debate on the Reed motion. That's what we're voting on. And the Republican leader tries to coat that or characterize that as a vote on the Reed motion. It is not. We want to vote on the Reed motion. We want to vote, but we will not be allowed to vote on the Reed motion on the proposal which the majority leader has offered, which has a majority support in this Senate, we will not be allowed to vote on that if debate is not ended, if the filibuster continues, because 60 senators are not willing to end it. We will have at least 50-plus to end debate. But let it be clear, let the public understand that if we're not allowed to vote on the Reed measure tonight, the Republicans presumably will continue their filibuster, and we are not going to just simply allow them to defeat it. We are not going to just simply sit down and say, well, we could.
couldn't end the debate in the filibuster. We didn't get 60 votes if we don't tonight. We're not going to do that. That's not going to happen tonight. This is too important to simply let a minority defeat the will of the majority by a filibuster. Now, the Republican leader wants to characterize this again and mischaracterize this, saying he's willing to have a vote right now on the Reid motion. No, he's not. No, he's not. If we were allowed to vote on the Reid motion, that would be fine. That's a regular majority vote. But the, major what the Republican leader wants is to require 60 votes on the Reid motion in order for it to pass. That's not the way things happen under our rules. Under our rules, 60 votes are required to end the debate if the minority threatens a filibuster and insists that it will filibuster unless a measure gets 60 votes. So we know what's happening. We saw it last night. We saw it here today. It's clearly the threat of a filibuster in the hope that we will say that Reed will be pulled down and defeated if we don't get 60 votes. That's what this is all about. And this time, we simply cannot, we simply cannot allow this measure to be talked to death and a vote denied. We cannot be thwarted because the American economy here is at stake. And so tonight, if we don't get 60 votes, and let me repeat this so that everyone understands it. Tonight, if 60 votes are not there to end debate, if the Republicans intend to filibuster, then tonight, that's what's going to happen. The public will see very, very clearly that it is a filibuster, if they haven't seen it already. I yield, well, it's not up to me to yield the floor. No, and I, I will make uh, comments later. I see that the senator from New Hampshire. The senator from New Hampshire is recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I ask unanimous consent to speak for up to 10 minutes. Is there objection without objection? So. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh allocated 30 minutes each, but I have no objection to the gentlelady having five additional minutes as long as five additional minutes are added to the Republican side. Without, without objection, she'll have, uh, uh, the Senator from New Hampshire will have 10 minutes, and the Republican side will have an extra five minutes. I, I appreciate um, the consideration of my colleague from Georgia. Thank you, Senator Isaacson. Uh, Mr. President, I come to the floor today because I want to share with people what I'm hearing from my constituents in New Hampshire about the situation that we're in here in Washington. I've heard from small business owners, from retirees, from working people <clears throat> all across the state. And one of the things that struck me about the majority of people that I've heard from is that they're willing to make sacrifices to help this country address our debt and our deficits. But they want to see us here in Congress act. And they want to see us compromise. So let me just take a minute, a few minutes and share some of the comments that I've received from the people of New Hampshire. Um, first is from Diane, who's from Manchester, our largest city. Diane says, please get off the party line and work together. My welfare and the welfare of my small business is at risk. I only employ five people, but that doesn't, but it's five people that don't need to collect unemployment or take another job. Don't take away what's left of my retirement by crashing the market. Work as a we, not as an I, and get it done. This is not the first time the debt cap needs to be raised, and it won't be the last. Please do what will have to be done anyway so we can continue to bring this country back. I don't want to lose my business, she says. Who's going to win the next election is not what any of you should be thinking about. I believe if you don't act, all of you will lose. That was Diane from Manchester. Now David from Meredith says, at the age of 25, I'm already the owner of a small software company in the Lakes region. We currently have five employees with plans to grow. 
We're expecting our profits for next year to exceed $1 million. As an employer, small business owner, and at my age, I feel as though I will be affected by budget decisions we make during the next week and into the future. I want to make sure that America stays as one of the best nations in the world. And he goes on to say, I have never written a letter to any member of Congress before tonight. And then we have Janine from Auburn, who says, settle the budget now. The dysfunction in Congress is embarrassing the country. As a small business owner, I can't afford the uncertainty of a political fiasco. If interest rates rise, I can't keep my business afloat. I would rather pay increased taxes. And Eric from Hollis says, as a small business owner, I'm unable to plan and hire employees due to the uncertainty the current standstill in Washington has created. Please get the USA back to work and making progress and stop the bickering. And then Brenda from Enfield says, my 77-year-old husband retired last year. I'm planning on retiring at the end of this year, collecting Social Security at full retirement age of 65. We've been good citizens, running our own small business for 40 plus years, and we've been diligent in taking responsibility for our own retirement savings. As you know, over the past two years, due to economic pressures, we faced substantial reductions of our retirement portfolio and again now face irreparable damage just as we retire. My husband and I urge you to do whatever it takes to build a cooperative bridge in Congress to protect the economy from further trauma. Cynthia from Exeter says, I'm receiving Social Security due to a disability, but I would gladly give up $5 a month. This is Cynthia, who's on Social Security. If everyone shared in the idea of balancing our nation's budget issues and deficit, I would like to see revenue raised. At the same time, I would be willing to sacrifice some of my Social Security. And finally, Sue from Campton says, my husband and I would be willing to pay higher income taxes, and we would be in that higher tax bracket to come up with a compromise to save this great nation. I hope that when you read this message, you'll understand that there's a majority of Americans who are willing to sacrifice for our country. Please find compromise. Our great state of New Hampshire and our country depends on it. Well. I want to tell Diane and David and Sue and all the others who have called and emailed and written to me that I agree with them. We must act and we must compromise. And that's what I'm trying to do. That's why I've supported a comprehensive approach to dealing with this country's debt and deficits. It's a, an approach that's been bipartisan, offered by the so-called Gang of Six. It addresses all aspects of our budget domestic, discretionary spending, defense spending, mandatory programs, and revenues. But I understand that we're not going to be able to get that done between now and Tuesday. So that's why I'm willing to support an approach that only make cuts to the budget, because I know that we have to compromise. But compromise means that everyone, all sides, the House and the Senate, Republicans and Democrats, all sides have to give something up. I believe we have good people in the Senate on both sides of the aisle, the majority of whom want to see a resolution to this impasse. Well, the time is now for all of us to compromise and to do what's in the best interests of this country. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.